Okay, this looks like this is coming on now. Fixing to, uh, fixing to find out some more details about the, uh, about the, uh, paperwork that was filled out on prior President Donald J. Trump. So if you would please, please listen. Gotcha. And good day. We, this is Andrea Mitchell reports in Washington. The affidavit the Justice Department used to win approval for the FBI's search of Mar-a-Lago is being released at any moment uh, by order of the Justice Department, approving it by the federal judge, the judge magistrate on the case. Much of it is likely to be redacted to conceal critical information about the sources and methods that the government used to persuade the judge that there was probable cause for him to, uh, probable cause of potential crimes to justify the search of former president's home. The judge ordered the unusual release of the affidavit in part to debunk the explosion of conspiracy theories about the search, leading to escalating threats against the FBI and other law enforcement officials. All this sharpening the country's political divide as President Biden escalates his attacks on what he is now criticizing as, quote, MAGA Republicans, calling the MAGA philosophy semi-fascist, later speaking at his first campaign rally ahead of the midterms. Donald Trump isn't just a former president, he is a defeated former president. Trump and the extreme MAGA Republicans have made their choice to go backwards, full of anger, violence, hate, and division. We choose to build a better America. Joining me now, NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley and NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Ryan, what is the latest on this? So just to hit the docket just now is a motion to unseal. So, or it's essentially, it's an order to unseal rather. So this will be unsealed any moment. I think we're just all sort of waiting on PACER, which is the federal uh, court uh, docket system, the electronic uh, system that's basically stuck in the 1990s, uh, sort of trying to get this updated and online. Uh, so essentially, I think we're just waiting on them to actually formally unseal this document, but the docket entries are all there. Basically, it seems like DOJ has hit their deadline. There's been a motion to, uns uh, there's been an order to unseal these documents, but we're just waiting uh, for this all to get refle uh, refreshed on the uh, federal court system, Andrea. So let's go forward and see what's going on here. This is a preview, which we've already done heard. Let's go forward. Included names of witnesses, uh, grand jury material, which has to be under seal, names of law enforcement. And we know the threats have risen against members of law enforcement since uh, this search was executed. But might we learn more about the timeline? Might we learn more about attempts the government made to try to get information, retrieve it from the former president? We know that he has, in his own filings, uh, talked about the fact there were subpoenas uh, that were executed and to provide video of the storage location of Mar-a-Lago to provide documents. Could we learn more about how long this has been going on and what uh, possible other clues there might be in this? Now, typically in epic Let's go forward to more. Post. And uh, joining us now, Andrew Weissman, senior member of special counsel Mueller's investigation of Donald Trump and a former FBI general counsel. And also with us, three former. Let's go forward to more. This is all preview. Terribly, we'll be getting these documents. Um Let's go forward. Forward. Going forward. 
someone who jumped the uh, the fence to the property at, at FBI Chicago and started throwing items at the building. So it's there, um, but not only protecting personnel, but protecting the, even the nature of the material that was seized. So while I would like to see a hint, of course, and we may well see the number of top secret, the number of uh, sensitive compartmented information documents, and then confidential, and then secret. Let's go forward. Things. Um, the first is, as others have said, we knew the timeline beginning and end, but. Let's go forward. What we're looking for is the bottom left hand right there just changed. Patient creates a risk that persons who are accused but exonerated may be held up to public ridicule. Back up a little bit. Let's see what's going on here. Should remain or to seal. for obstruction in this particular case, that it wasn't just an abstract concern. So that is um, just confirming uh, in this brief and what we surmised from the uh, statutory site in the search warrant that was previously disclosed of um, section 1519 of the federal criminal statutes, which as I mentioned, is the obstruction statute. Um, and just so that is at least on one hint. You know, Andrew, just picking up on this, on page six, I've just noticed it says under witness intimidation, if witnesses' identities are exposed, they could be subjected to harms, including retaliation, intimidation, or harassment, and even threats to their physical safety. As the court has already noted, these concerns are not hypothetical in this case. And then to your point, it's all, the rest of that is blacked out. So they've clearly given examples of, what, of when that has happened with witness intimidation. They then go on to say that other categories are an investigation roadmap. And this is um, and this is sorry, the Justice Andrew. Department. Yeah, this is signed by, uh, as you know, Juan Antonio Gonzalez, the U.S. Attorney on this case, and Jay Bratt, the Chief Counterintelligence and Export Control of the section of the uh, National Security Division. So they go through the investigation roadmap. They go through the safety of law enforcement personnel. And here, they have a number of other redactions. It's a minor, but important redactions are necessary to protect the safety of law enforcement personnel. And they say they are appropriate to protect the identity and personnel, the safety of an investigative agent, specifically information in the affidavit that would identify the affiant, such as by name or through biographical information should remain or to seal. And then that is redacted, the next couple of sentences. Then privacy interests. So premature disclosure, as the Supreme Court has long recognized, premature disclosure of investigative information creates a risk that persons who are accused but exonerated may be held up to public ridicule. And that, of course, would be to protect uh, people who might be charged in this case. And the conclusion is, for the reasons stated herein, the court should maintain or to seal the text the government has marked for redaction. And that was the argument. So they've, uh, they've released the argument that they made to the court and we saw the judge deciding very quickly in agreement, Andrew, with the Justice Department that these reductions, should, reductions should be made. Another line, Andrea, is on the bottom of page nine. After um, a redacted section, which are clearly, as you note, examples, um, the unredacted section from the, the government's brief says, in short, the government has well-founded concerns that steps may be taken to frustrate or otherwise interfere with this investigation if facts in the affidavit were prematurely disclosed. This is quite remarkable when we're talking about the former president of the United States, just to give this a surreal quality of that statement. And as the panelists here, the sort of esteemed group here knows, these concerns can be raised by the government as general concerns, which 
I think particularly important here is that the government isn't relying on sort of hypothetical potential concerns, which we have all raised when we were in the government. Here they clearly are giving the court specific examples um, that justify reliance on those general concerns in this particular case. Joyce Vance, uh, if you've been able to read through this document, as Andrew just pointed out, they're very specific. There are redactions, but it's very clear what they are concerned about. And it, it is a premature release by you know people involved in the case, who could be the former president. We don't know that yet. It could be attorneys or other people in his, in his inner circle, confidants. So one thing, sorry, Andrea. One thing that's for certain is that there is nothing good that happens for the former president upon the release of this document. He will be reduced, I suspect, to arguing that the redactions indicate that DOJ is still hiding material that would prove his innocence or whatever it is that he's going to say. But the specificity with which DOJ identifies concerns then redacting examples in, in the case of witnesses to protect those witnesses from dangerous situations makes it very clear that there has been a course of conduct here involving the former president or perhaps people around him that leads DOJ to have concerns that the judge too seems to have accepted in permitting so much of this material to m remain redacted. I think important contextual note for all of us, obviously we would all like to read every word of this affidavit, but it's far more important that DOJ be able to protect the integrity of its investigation, that there not be any more public signaling than absolutely essential of where DOJ is headed next in this investigation, what steps it will take, what witnesses it will interact with, so that this case can proceed to its logical conclusion and justice can be done. We don't, we don't know if anyone will be charged as a result of this investigation. Much of the evidence that we're discussing publicly looks very incriminating, specifically for the former president who was involved in personal review of these documents. But the important thing here is to be willing to look at the materials that are released today in an unredacted form because this is obviously a serious effort by the Justice Department to be thoughtful about its legal obligation in a situation like this to balance the public's interest, the public's right to know, against the need to protect the integrity of what continues to be an ongoing investigation at this point from all appearances. Those are two very hard sorts of principles to balance in a situation like this. We will certainly learn more if, if this motion providing DOJ's reasons for what it kept sealed and what it unsealed is an accurate predictor of just how much information we're about to see. I would still expect heavy redactions in the affidavit itself and we should all try to not be unhappy about those redactions because they will reflect the work that DOJ is continuing to do to bring a measure of justice in this situation. And Joyce, uh, Neil Katyal is also joining us, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, former law clerk for Justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, Neil, uh, this, uh, this affidavit being released is, as was just pointed out to us, not unprecedented but unusual, rare. And it, it, uh, it will include all of these redactions, which in this political climate will certainly lead to more conspiracy theories and more attacks uh, from the Trump world. Yeah, Andrea, that, that's why I think that this document, I've been spending the last few minutes just quietly reading it, the first document, we don't have the affidavit, but we do have the Justice Department's rationale for why they are unsealing and proposing redactions of this affidavit. And it's a really sober, careful document, I think done precisely because that's the way the department traditionally does business, but also here because of that kind of political climate. I think they had to get everything right. And this is a really powerful, um, balanced document. It begins by talking about the department's interest in transparency, that they want to get information to the public. But then they say they have serious concerns here because revealing all the information will provide the target of the investigation, that is one Donald Trump, a quote, roadmap to the future investigation and reveal witnesses. And as Andrew Weissman just pointed out at page nine, they say those concerns are particularly well-founded here. They're talking about a former president of the United States 
There's one other part that hasn't been discussed yet, which is the last page of this department filing that tries to justify what they're doing here in their position. The last page says that they want to release a letter from Donald Trump's counsel to the public about all this. And they are waiting to hear from Trump's counsel about that. So again, I think they've underscored their interest in transparency. But this is also a kind of checkmate move by Merrick Garland, both here and in the earlier documents this week, the Bill Barr memos about the Ukraine investigation. Attorney General Garland's done everything right. He's not leaked. He's not provided any of this information. But he's now under court orders, both with respect to Barr and with respect to Mar-a-Lago, to reveal some information. And that information that's coming out is, as all the panelists have discussed so far, looking really bad for Donald Trump. And we'll see when we see what the affidavit says. But I suspect the case is going to get even stronger and much more difficult for Donald Trump, even in the public side. I've got the first nine pages of the affidavit in support of an application under Rule 41A for the warrant to search and seize. So I think you're all going to be starting to get this, as I am now getting it. Let me just show you also the list of redactions, which is listed by paragraph. So this is the list of paragraphs that have been blacked out and redacted. One involves agent safety. Ryan Riley, have you been able to read some of this? Ryan, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Tell us what you know. Sure. So I think one highlight I wanted to bring up here is that in this affidavit, the narrow referral is referenced here. And the narrow's White House liaison division director, after a preliminary review of these 15 boxes that were originally received to the National Archives from Trump, went through those boxes and found they contained newspaper, magazines, printed news articles, photos, miscellaneous printouts, notes, presidential correspondence, personal and post-presidential records, and, quote, open quote, a lot of classified records, close quote. So that was what sort of kicked this all off, all of these classified records that were found by the National Archives when they eventually received this initial load of boxes that came in from the Trump camp after he left office. I'm looking even on page two here. It says that the FBI's investigation, Ryan, has established that documents bearing classification markings, which appear to contain national defense information, was among the materials it contained in the 15 boxes that were stored at the premises in an unauthorized location. And that is, again, the initial 15 boxes. Further, there is some redactions, and it says, further, there is probable cause to believe that additional documents that contain classified NDA, which is national defense information, or that are presidential records subject to record retention requirements currently remain at the premises. There is also probable cause to believe that evidence of obstruction will be found at the premises. Joyce Vance, can you pick it up from there? Well, I'm not all the way through the affidavit, Andrea, but I think one of the interesting bits of information we get early on tallies up with what you've just said about this assessment that there's national defense information to be found at Mar-a-Lago. And further on in the affidavit, we get a little bit of specificity about where in the Espionage Act DOJ is looking. They're looking at a provision in that subsection that doesn't necessarily refer to classified material. Of course, the former president has already fronted out this apparent defense effort that he somehow magically waived his wand and declassified everything. DOJ seems to be sidestepping that fight and relying on a part of the Espionage Act that only requires them to prove that the information that he kept in his possession would be national defense adjacent information. And so that part of the legal rationale for DOJ's search begins to pop into clarity when we see this information. Something that seems, I think, important to point out is that DOJ does not engage in an effort like this based on half-baked legal theories. They will have tried to lock down with specificity the sorts of legal rationales and the specific crimes in the federal criminal code that they're pursuing to ensure that there aren't any sort of 
and I'm using the term defense lightly here, but defense is floating around that the former president could use to establish reasonable doubt. So as we continue to read through the affidavit, we'll get a better understanding of the precise legal theories DOJ is pursuing and then how they expected the evidence that they found when they searched to establish those criminal violations. And let me just uh, pick up on what you're talking about, because in the initial 15 documents, uh, 15 boxes that were turned over when they went to the former president's uh, lawyers and went to him and to Mar-a-Lago, so that when they got the 15 boxes that the National Archives had, had been seeking, already all the way back in January, here are some of the classifications that were noted by the FBI agent who was designating the reasons uh, in the affidavit, this is in the document to justify the affidavit. Uh, HCS, which is Human Control System, this is a designation by a report from a CIA officer or possibly defense intelligence agency based on conversations with a confidential human source overseas. That is a spy, and this could be the most alarming of any of the designations of these of these classifications. Another one is ORCON, O-R-C-O-N, Originator Control. The agency issuing the report controls that sees the document. No foreign, that is, cannot be shared with foreign nationals, indicating high sensitivity. FISA, referring to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and SI, Signals Intelligence, in other words, intercepts of communications. These are sources and methods. These are the crown jewels of the intelligence agencies covered intelligence you know, for many years for NBC. And I would uh, turn to Harry Lippman and Paul Chartman to uh, bear me out on this. Harry? Yeah, so without doubt, and I've had a chance to quickly look at it. It's, it's more or less what we expected. We have a full-bodied account of the legal justification, which, by the way, Andrea, there's legal speak here, but it's basically what the government is doing is justifying suppression of speech, as in any other context. So they're saying there's a compelling reason, and it's the least onerous alternative we could choose. Then on paragraph 47, which you just named, we have this revelation, a year, a year after he has left the White House that his the boxes he took with them, which they knew had these keepsakes, like from Kim Jong-un, uh, actually have some 700 pages of some extremely sensitive documents, the sorts of things that will reveal sources and methods. Pretty much the rest is blacked out with the important exceptions starting around paragraphs 52 and 3 of this back and forth exchange. So you see Trump basically, you know, hanging himself with his own correspondence. And we have an appendix that also lays out a letter uh, from Trump's counsel. And they, we now know they want to publish another, but are waiting for uh, Trump's approval. It'll be interesting if they get it. So that's the basic um, overview here. Law and uh, why they were so alarmed in January when they, when they finally saw what he had taken, and ba some back and forth between Team Trump and DOJ slash archives. And Ryan Riley, as you continue reading through this, uh, let's talk about some of the things that are jumping out at you. That's right. So, I mean, while a lot of pages do indeed look like this and are pretty heavily redacted, there's one part of this that uh, jumped out at me because uh, Cash Patel has sort of been at the center of a lot of uh, these, this, these charges. He was one of the people who uh, Trump wanted to designate as one of his representatives uh, to the National Archives. He gets mentioned on here on page, uh, on page 19. Um, it cites this Breitbart story that ran on May 5th, um, and it says it's, the article stated that Cash Patel uh, had uh, wanted to like was uh, found classified. He was basically justifying the reason that they found classified materials among the records that the former president of the United States provided to Nara from Largo. Patel alleged that such reports were misleading because Flotus had declassified the materials at issue. This all sort of goes back to this post hoc excuse that they've come up with this uh, they, this idea that Donald Trump declassified a bunch of documents that were found at Mar-a-Lago before he left office. So that's actually cited directly in this affidavit. 
affidavit uh, as sort of a reason for supporting the reason that they needed to actually go and get these documents at Mar-a-Lago because it didn't, it didn't seem like something that they were necessarily buying as an excuse. So while we got a lot of redacted pages in here, Cash Patel pops up uh, in this Breitbart story from May as one of the reasons uh, for supporting their, uh, their reasoning for needing to go in there and get those documents. Andrea. Now, let, you, let me just explain who Cash Patel is. Cash Patel, uh, originally he was working for House Intelligence when House Intelligence was run by Republicans, by Devin Nunes. Uh, then he ended up in the NSC, in the Trump NSC. He ended up at the Defense, uh, excuse me, the uh, Director of National Intelligence Office. And he finally ended up in the Pentagon at the, in the closing months of the Trump administration. Uh, he's been very aggressive on trying on uh, defending the president. He was designated as one of the president's liaisons with National Archives post-presidency. And he's now been working for Truth Social, which is the president's um, social media uh, website, which replaced when he was kicked off of Twitter. So that is a very active conservative voice, Cash Patel in the national security arena. Um, Andrew Weissman, can you bring us up to date on what more you're seeing in this sure. extraordinary a, affidavit. Yeah. So following up on that point about Cash Patel, so um, what's pretty clear here is that um, when we get to paragraphs uh, 52 and 53 of this 37-page, um, I think, uh, document, um, what the government's doing is they're alerting the court to what's called Brady information. They're alerting the court to information that could be on the other side. So that's why they attach a letter from one of the president's counsel. And it's why they make a reference, as noted, to this interview that Prakash Patel says that these records um, could be declassified. Um, and others that, that the president had the power to declassify them. Um, and so it was uh, improper and misleading to suggest that um, that he actually was storing classified information at Mar-a-Lago um, because it's, it's, it, he claimed that these are declassified. What's notable is after that statement in paragraph 53, that affidavit has an enormous number of blacked out paragraphs that go on from 53 all the way to 61, where clearly the government is disputing that interpretation. They're still alerting the court to it. And the reason you know that they have to be disputing it is not just the location, but um, they have the dates um, listed that they, Cash Patel is making this statement in the, the article in May of 2022, and in paragraph 61, they refer to an email from the Department of Justice in June of 2022, so the following month, where the department is saying there is classified information at Mar-a-Lago. So they're still taking that position um, and not crediting the uh, statements in the Breitbart article. But it seems, you know, if you are doing tea leaf reading, that this, the paragraphs, you know, between uh, 53 and 61 are probably addressing that issue of classification. It's, it's, so, it's so, so enlightening. Thank you so much, Andrew, because Brady material is in every case. Uh, the prosecution is required to provide information that they have that could be exculpatory to a potential defendant. Uh, required not to keep that secret and required to at least provide it. And they're making it very transparent to the court, at least, that Absolutely. they are disputing. They are disputing the defense argument, the argument that the president, former president, had the ability to preemptorily, um, as Joyce was saying, wave a magic wand and declassify things without any procedure or process on these documents that are supposed to be, many of them, read in a seal, in a room, in a vault, basically, a place in the White House that is protected and, and certainly places elsewhere, not in the president's home in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, Frank Figlusi, you know, you're so familiar with all of these designations. These classification designations are, as has been reported by us, by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others, uh, there certainly were reports that the initial 15 boxes last January from Mar-a-Lago that went to the National Archives had all of these red flags. Yeah, look, I cannot emphasize enough, Andrea, as someone who has held the various compartmented uh, clearances that are referred to here at times in my career, 
how incredibly sensitive this is. Um, you referenced the, the H uh, compartment. That is human. That is a human source. Um, that is often a singular human source that is reporting perhaps inside a foreign government, maybe even inside an adversary's foreign government or service. Um, the, the reading that kind of material could easily give away a conversation that could only have been heard by that singular human source. Similarly, we see references to SIG and signals intelligence, to FISA. These are electronic intercepts of phone or, or email conversations, text messaging. Again, the most sensitive things that the United States government does. But I think Joyce referenced, you know, getting us to the espionage statute. The references here are to NDI, National Defense Information. Understand that that's a subset of classified information. Not all classified information is national defense information. So not only is it sensitive, but it goes toward defense of the United States. So in incredibly sensitive. Number two, we see references to probable cause to believe that evidence of obstruction obstruction will be found if we get to search this place. So that means that perhaps someone, a source, a witness, has said, hey, if you look here, you're going to see evidence of attempts to mask, um, screw up your case, change things. Maybe, you know, I have seen in my in my experience in espionage cases, I've seen government employees white out the classified headers and footers on documents. I've seen them destroy documents if they think someone's coming for a search. So someone has indicated to the government somehow that you'll find evidence of the obstruction here. And that's that's intrigued me for a while, the choice of that chart. So we're dealing with the most sensitive information. We're dealing with a, a belief, probable cause that a judge agreed to, that there was some kind of obstruction going on and they find that evidence of obstruction at Mar-a-Lago. And uh, just, to, just to put a point on that, we, we know how casual President Trump in office was with these very, very sensitive sources. We know from all of our reporting that when uh, early in the administration he brought the foreign minister, the Russian foreign minister, Lavrov, into the Oval Office and the Russian ambassador. He disclosed a human source. These are sources that Frank, who's worked in the field and others of you know, can take decades to develop. But this was a source of another, another allied government, an allied intelligence service, who had to be withdrawn because of the revelation to the Russians that this person even existed, which could compromise not only all of the uh, of his colleagues as well as relatives. I mean, or his or her. Uh, Melissa Murray, an NYU law professor, joining us now. Uh, Melissa, what you're reading into this on the legal basis for proceeding with the search of Mar-a-Lago. I mean, Andrea, you really do have to read between the lines here. There's so many redactions here for obvious reasons to preserve the blueprint for the prosecution if one is to go forward, to preserve the identity of the FBI agents who worked on this, as well as any of the operatives who are mentioned here. But what stands out to me is in paragraph 61, where, again, they speak of this letter from the DOJ counsel to the former president's team explaining that the premises at Mar-a-Lago have not been secured, that they aren't secured, and that they are asking for all of the documents that were moved from the White House to Mar-a-Lago to be kept where they are and for that location to be left preserved. And this, I think, which came on June 8th, 2022, reading between the lines, I wonder if this is not something related to the revelation that there is perhaps surveillance footage that the FBI looked at and saw that perhaps there was something going on with this room. So there's a lot going on here, but at bottom, this was an order to leave the materials as they were. And again, I think it goes to that question of obstruction. I want to weigh in on what they're talking about here. First of all, um, this is so unusual for this to be coming out the way that it's coming out. You know, whenever the Nixon trials happened, and even Watergate, uh, there was so much of that stuff that never ever got fully exposed to the general public. And what they're doing here towards ratting out their own work what it basically amounts to goes beyond anything that I've ever remembered the White House ever doing why they're doing it it may have 
potential motives in behind towards wanting to clarify or clear the air towards the significance of all this. But we already knew that it was classified uh, top secret material before even this come out. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, it couldn't, it couldn't have happened to a better group of people, regardless whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, because it was they that sat idly by, and though there was a few resistant movements towards allowing for Donald Trump to become the United States President, he still become the United States President under both sides' watch. We've seen the difficulties in what Donald Trump was doing towards not only him becoming impeached once, but, in, but becoming impeached twice. So, basically, what I'm getting out of this is the only reason why this is coming out the way that it's coming out is to justify further actions in what the FBI, the, the, uh, the people that they keep talking about here, it will justify their actions eventually towards what the ultimate punishment or penalty will be to Donald J. Trump and his prior administration. That's what, to me, that's what they're doing. And that's why they're doing it. Because in, in reality, really, we don't, we don't have no dog in this race other than the fact that he did take records that belong, sensitive records that did belong to the taxpayers of the United States that should have been kept within the confounds of the White House or uh, classified material uh, in areas that, that should have been maintained and, and left there. We'll probably never find out what the actual charges was and who it was about and what it was about and what uh let's say what country or what um issue that it was pertaining to a certain particular country we'll probably never find out the details but they're just letting the public know that yes uh they scored a hit Yes, Donald Trump uh, was guilty under these particular charges, and yes, we're pursuing towards allowing for certain parts of this to be exposed to the general public. Once more, it was the Republican Party that put in a unprofessional politician such as Donald J. Trump, which in a way could be a good thing towards helping to drain the swamp, but in another way has helped to backfire on not only the Democrats, but also the Republicans too as well, because I still say that all this originated in the Reagan and, the, and uh, Mr. H, Walter H. Bush's administration towards what that they didn't do that they should have done, because I personally believe that the United States White House knowed that Saddam Hussein did not have bombs of mass destruction. They knew that. But they led the American people to believe that, and that was what supposedly justified Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I personally believe because of Desert Storm and because of Desert Shield, and the way that they handled that situation, brought a calamity into the American people's lives pertaining to 9-11. That obviously somebody had the right amount of money, somebody had the right amount of sense, and we're not talking about sheep holders or goat, ho uh, goat herders here. We're talking about somebody that had enough sense to be able to dialect in how that they was going to do, what that they was going to do, and sponsor and pay for these people of doing what they've done pertaining to 9-11 that we know come from the Saudi Arabian territory. We know that. There's 
something going on here. I smell a rat in the wood pile. Especially if you base it upon that in which what Donald Trump said either right before or during the golf tournament that the Saudi Arabian government was sponsoring at the time that was up pretty close to New York City where the where the Twin Towers actually fell going on 21 years ago now. Um, something some somebody hit somebody's nerve that said you know what we're gonna have to go through with this on a urgency type scale because there ain't no telling what Donald Trump is gonna do and how he's gonna do it and we're gonna have to cover our tracks some way or another whenever he exposes this to the American people because it was Donald J Trump that said the American people still to this day has not got down to the bottom of what occurred pertaining to 9-11 I truly believe that that whenever he said that it basically backfired on him to the degree that certain people working in certain offices said you know what he just crossed the line he hit a nerve we need to go after whatever material that he's got to cover our own tracks because God only knows what this unprofessional politician is going to expose or tell to the American people What's more, it was the Republicans that put him in power. It was the Democrats that allowed for him to become in power. They wanted a circus clown in this circus because anybody with any sense at all would know that obviously a great deal of mistakes had to have been made in the past 30 plus years to put us where we are today towards being 30 plus trillion dollars in debt, all our jails being full, all the drugs coming over here, all the overdoses, all the teenage suicides, all the uh, other corruption that has devastated our courts and devastated our, our so-called churches over here. Obviously somebody dropped the ball in that term or, in, or within that 30-year uh, um, term that now to this day we still haven't gotten down to the bottom of all this pertaining to what Donald J. Trump was actually either trying to hide or trying to expose to the American people. There has been one lie told after another lie told after another lie and now they're telling lies to cover up their other lies. To where if they would have just told the truth in how that ever occurred, whenever nine tapes wound up going to the White House, because at that time they wasn't handling things near as protectively as they are today, and you could send a package to the White House, and guess where it went? It went to the White House. What is that, 1600 Pennsylvania or something like that? Um, it didn't get classified towards going to the nearest Secret Service field office and then analyze it before it ever got to the White House. And I'm sure because they have set that up the way that they've set it up now since 9-11, I'm sure that a great deal of the material that people send to the president never gets there. Never gets there. I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm confirmative on, on what I'm saying. For whatever reason, it gets sifted, it gets looked at, it gets analyzed, and it gets shoved back into a 22, catch 22 corner, and basically uh, out of sight, out of mind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which I think, personally, is a bad thing, because uh, what if somebody from another faraway country was associated with another country, and they know that there was a plot going to be played on the United States government similar towards 9-11 and they could have contacted uh, somebody in the White House that could have diverted around seeing this type of a, another re, uh, another uh, attempt of doing something like that that it basically uh, minimizes our security differences towards the American government taking care of of the American people because whenever a package, a box, a t-shirt, a letter, uh, maybe some beautiful art 
Uh, maybe somebody just felt inclined of maybe sending a lot of money uh, to the to the White House, and they and they post market to to uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and it's supposed to go to that particular president, and it don't go to that president. It's it's kind of a you know what I'm saying a contradictory uh, two phase thing there that I feel like is is not operating above and beyond the board pertaining to how that Homeland Security now is taking taking the initiative towards sifting through stuff that even they should not be sifting through. It's got to the point there's too many cooks in the kitchen, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, and now they're beginning to question one another's motives in the who, the what, the when, and the why. And this is the results from it. This is the results from a group of people that was acting unresponsible, that was acting careless, that now they're questioning their own their own body, their own people within their body, uh, pertaining to these uh, these accusations. Now they're questioning these uh, attempts towards trying to either cover up or shut up the truth from the American people. And to be quite frank with you, I think the American people deserve better than this. I think that the American people deserve better than this that has went on now, that has put us consequently in the shape that we're in right now, even before COVID, even before COVID, there was still some mishandling dues that was going on pertaining to our Congress versus our president, our president versus the Supreme Court. Um, there was just a lot of... Uh, I'm going to use the word blackballing. There was a lot of blackballing going on in not being completely honest with the American people. We're not stupid. We're not We're not ignorant people. We're really not. We're actually good people. Um, we understand that there's, there's probably certain things that, that the American people don't have no business understanding or knowing about, regardless whether it's uh, classified material. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there pertaining to what went on with the Roswell cases out in New Mexico um, versus chit chats and talks with other country and, and other prime ministers and presidents in, in other countries. We're not stupid. We understand that a lot of stuff gets hidden from us because we really don't have no business in seeing it, hearing it, or knowing about it. But whenever you're talking about something so substantial that we're facing down the barrels right now of possibly the planet itself cooking because the oligarchs wanted to cover up the truth pertaining to what was being done in dragging out precious resources out of the ground. Whenever we're talking about people that is so lethal like Kim Young Young over in North Korea that to this day we still don't know fully what his intentions was when he kept telling the American people we have a we have a Christmas present for the Americans we have a Christmas present for the Americans and then all of a sudden everybody gets sick with COVID so there's too many loose ends here that I feel like they're trying to give somewhat of an account for but at the same time can we really trust can we really trust our own government? Can we really trust the things that they are saying and doing right now? Especially whenever you go back before Ronald, or let me say this, before Mr. H. Bush, before Desert Storm and Desert Shield, if you go back of what occurred during uh, the eight-year tenure of Ronald Reagan, and then you'll go back further in into what went on, um... Yeah, there was there was some corruption, you know, going to Watergate and the, and the Nixon hearings and stuff like that. But by and large, people didn't have to be undermined by their own by their own security here in the United States. And today, we know that our security gets compromised. We get hacked. Uh, some people's identifications has been stolen. 
uh, some people has bought houses or, or made big investments and they didn't have nothing to do with it because somebody got a hold of their information, got, got their name. Uh, we got all this stuff going on pertaining to these spy agencies. I think it was, um, I think it was Obama that wound up kicking out some sort of a Russian uh, spy agency that told them to pack up and go home. I don't know, I, to this day, I don't think the American people still don't know what, what all that was about. Um, there's all this shit chat about, about uh, Russia uh, getting into our voting privileges and basically uh, causing things to happen that wasn't supposed to happen. There's just too many unanswered questions that now Donald Trump has brought up to the table. And as far as I am concerned, all this stuff pertaining to the FBI and how that they're handling all this stuff just helps to verify the uncertainties that in which what Donald Trump was possibly either going to expose or hiding from the American people of it being exposed. I don't know which way, but either way, there's a lot of questions that has not been answered. And in that atmosphere of doubt has created fear, it has created madness, it has created doubt, it has created trust issues, it has created other types of anxieties that now the world or the people in this part of the world in the United States are beginning to scratch their heads towards exactly what, what is going on. You know, whenever they posted Secret Service as it being secret, we know for a fact that Secret Service has gotten caught again and again and again towards doing things that is inappropriate pertaining to that agency. As I have said before, there is not, there ain't no telling how many people's lives, and I'm talking about thousands of people's lives that has been brushed up with Homeland Security, similar towards my own, that has basically taken on a lick towards character assassination. To this day, they still won't never get over, or had never gotten over, pertaining to what was done, supposedly in behind closed doors with Secret Service. We know for a fact that Secret Service deleted all its files, either the day of or the day after January 6th, that caused a great deal of harm and a great deal of disturbances pertaining to our government. So, whenever you get to looking at all the loose ends and all the things that hadn't been discussed and all the answers to all the questions, guess what? You just opened up a brand new bushel basket. You just verified the very things that the people was only thinking about. Now, they know that it's not an assumption, but it is in fact the truth. I mean, you, you have openly exposed by taking the toothpaste out of the tube or taking the genie out of the bottle, and guess what? Now, it cannot be put back in. And now, there will probably be serious, serious consequences either coming from the public or coming from even our own allies over in other parts of the country that will begin to question the authenticity of the sincerity and the honesty coming from the United States government. And any time you put yourself in this position, you have put yourself in a very, very, very dangerous category. And that's where we are as an American citizens, dealing not just with the things of Donald Trump, but dealing with the White House in general. And Paul Charlton, pick it up there in terms of the whole question of obstruction, which is one of the one of, the, one of the three potential crimes that they were investigating in the affidavit. It's an extraordinary allegation, Andrea, and in the judge's order, 
allowing that parts of this affidavit be disclosed, he reminded everyone that that was one of his findings of probable cause. It's here in the affidavit. The judge reaffirmed that in his order, allowing that specific portions of this affidavit be disclosed. To think that there was obstruction of justice, that there was a hindering of the prosecution's ability to go forward is extraordinary. I want to add one other thing, if I may, to Andrew's, I think, excellent point here, that it is part of the DNA's, the DNA of the Department of Justice. It's part of their culture. It's inherent to the Department of Justice that we should embrace and respect, that they would share exculpatory information at this point in time, that they would anticipate the defense here, that the president has raised and certainly did in public articles before, that this wasn't classified information. You have to admire and respect that kind of careful examination of what may be a defense and what follows on as the probable cause to believe that that kind of argument doesn't hold water. I admire that. That's part of our Department of Justice. That's why career prosecutors are named as the individuals who sign off on these pleadings. And I think it underscores the careful nature of the way in which the Department of Justice first sought to obtain this search warrant and second, protected the information that ought not to be disclosed. And as we've been discussing this, that the nature of that information is of the highest category of classified secrets involving human intelligence, signals intelligence, which is electronic intercepts, the kinds of the kinds of methods and sources that should never be disclosed to our adversaries, certainly, and only to a very select group of allies, in fact, of allied intelligence services, if then. Tom Winter joining us now. Tom, you've been all over this affidavit and the justifications and the considerable redactions and whether or not this will put to rest some of the conspiracy theories, unlikely, at least from Trump world. Well, I think, Andrew, to first key in on your point about the redactions, it's a 38 page document, but a couple of those pages are tied to a letter that was attached as an exhibit from Trump counsel. So in reality, it's even less than that. And of that 21 pages, by my quick count here, approximately 21 pages are redacted in part or in full. So there is a lot of information here about this ongoing federal criminal investigation, the potential subjects of which we still don't know. And that's not surprising. We weren't going to find that out today. But we still don't have a lot of information as to why this investigation is occurring. You and others have well laid out here the potential ramifications with respect to national security in these documents. I think there's a there's several other things that were unsealed as a result of today's action, specifically federal prosecutors arguments for these documents to be released in redacted form if they were released as well. One thing I think I do want to point out is that there's a footnote in one of those documents I just referenced. It said the court has noted the disclosure of certain information pertaining to physical aspects of the premises could negatively affect the Secret Service's ability to carry out its protective functions. So clearly there's some information in here that has to do with how Mar-a-Lago is secured. And we've seen numerous references to that in the search warrant, namely the FBI agent who signed off on it said that the Mar-a-Lago facility and where these documents were believed to be was not at all the type of facility that should house these type of documents. Another thing I noted in the search warrant is that on the initial 15 boxes that were provided to the National Archives, they noted how kind of day to day notes and memos, the types of things that former President Trump might write out or might pass to his aides and other top government officials. When you look at those those type of things that were included in the boxes among them, then were these highly classified top secret type pieces of information that were just mixed in. In other words, there was really no system for delineating what might be day to day notes, a note to an acquaintance or a friend or an aide versus these really sensitive documents that are clearly the focus of this federal criminal investigation. So they noted that how these things were kind of just mixed together in the boxes and not clearly delineated. So I think that's probably another area of concern for them. Those were just a couple of observations that I had in a quick look at these these pages. But the devil is in the details and we'll continue to come through it. The devil is in the details pertaining to what he's talking about with Secret Service, regardless whether it's the protection of a prior president over in Florida at the compound 
or if it's other things that Secret Service have done that was a part of doing or that didn't do what they should have done that has allowed for this to get in the in the the arena that it's in right now. This is a very, very complex, dangerous arena that can go just as quickly to the far right as it is the far left. I mean extremely dangerous. This is this exceeds Watergate. Um, this explains uh, uh, the Nixon trial. This uh, exceeds uh, the, the Contra affairs. All of it put together. Everything that's been questioned about our uh, worldly stance on a global level, this exceeds all of that pertaining to danger. Because you ain't just talking about one or two records. I think in total they, they confiscated 700 documents and they have only pinpointed out the most crucial ones that 184 was considered classified and then another certain amount was considered top secret and then there was another amount of paperwork that was considered highly top secret that that is never supposed to be exposed to our adversaries or, or the general public in general. So they have been lax. Somebody has been lax. You know, everybody wants to keep pointing their finger at Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump done wrong. Okay, Donald Trump done wrong. But who was it that's supposed to be governed prior presidents whenever they lose an election to have ever allowed for this to have ever happened to begin with? How come heads isn't rolling up there in the White House pertaining to what somebody obviously knew that was happening, but nobody wanted to throw a red flag to it and stop it? Because it was very obvious. I mean, it, it, they had it all on TV pertaining to all them boxes that Donald Trump was loading up and taking home. And you know good and well that various... Uh, security agencies within the agency had to have known about that. They had to have watched him do all that out in plain view, but didn't nobody really and truly enforce him from doing that. So, where does the guilt really, really stop at? It's one thing to have a prior president to do what Donald Trump has done, which I agree was wrong. For whatever reason he done it, we may not never know. Maybe we will know. I don't know. But it's the people that is supposed to be in charge of security there at the White House that basically set back and allowed for this to occur out in broad daylight. Has nobody never brought any charges to them? Have they not lost have they been have they been reprimanded? Has anybody lost their jobs over this? Was it just plain peons? Or was it some people that is up in some very high position security places that allowed for this to happen? I mean, whenever you get to looking at the fault, the fault lies within a great deal of people other than just Donald J. Trump. That's the way I see it, and if I see it that way, I'm pretty sure there'll be other people that will see it the same way. You know, you want to use Donald Trump as an scapegoat because all them records left the White House. Well, that's only part of it. That's only part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, carelessness that went on here. That would be like you being able to walk into NORAD a highly sophisticated military base basically hidden from plain view underground in Colorado. They're pretty close to Colorado Springs and just being able to walk in and do whatever you wanted to do. Is that how lax that our security measures has become here in the United States? To the degree that just any and everybody can just walk walks right on in and do whatever that they want to do in whatever format that they want to do it in. This is the protection that we've been paying for 
for years that's coming out of our taxpaying money? I don't think to this day there's still not been true, true accountability towards who in God's name would have ever allowed for a bunch of foreigners from wherever to have gotten involved in hijacking the airplanes that was hijacked that day, which was four in total, and them doing what they done. Has anybody lost their jobs over that? Has the airline industry pertaining to the people that was training all them people down there in Florida? Has anybody not never really got down to the scratch the bottom of the barrel towards how in the world did that ever occur to begin with? In addition to how come our United States Air Force was not given the order to shoot the airplanes out of the sky that become entirely in a, in a no-fly zone pretending in New York City. Especially the second one. The first one, I can understand. All right, you hit them sidewind. It was a, it was a, it was a shot below the, the the bow. It was it was a, a you know it, it it was a it was a blindsided shot. The first airplane that hit the first tower. But the second one, after you know the chaos that was going on, and our military installations did not try to stop that in some way or another. And I realize it would have been a dirty deal either way. If, if the Air Force would have shot down that airplane, I'm pretty sure that there would have been all kinds of questions about authority figures towards who in the world gave who who and what the authority to do that. But wouldn't it have been better to have killed 200 people or however many people was on that second airplane that hit that second tower rather than hit the tower and bring down that tower too? That probably killed another thousand people? The way I've understood the ways of the military, I'm not a military expert, I'm not a military analyst, but you always dis decipher the decisions upon the numbers game. It's always about the numbers game. And whenever the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, you always ordinarily go with the needs of the many, pertaining to saving lives. Whenever you're caught in a dilemma between a hard place and a rock, damned if you do and damned if you don't, then the military strategy is supposed to work in any event that which is the lesser of the two evils. Would it have been better to kill 200 people that day and not allowing for them to hit the second tower? Or would it have been better just to sit back and allow it to happen and there be no, no defense uh, there wasn't even no actions of defense. Uh, the only thing that I've seen is that uh, the Air Force took, took a great deal of measure in protecting the current president that was in power at that time, which was George Jr. Bush. That probably already had a heads up in what was going to happen before it ever happened because I know for a fact that I've listened to material coming from various uh, agencies and one of those agencies knew the night before that it was going to occur and they tried to give out the warnings the proper warnings to the proper people and it was ignored it was ignored just like it was questioned with with uh, the the speaker of the house with and because of Donald Trump of concerns that the crowd was probably going to be massive and she was questioned of whether or not the National Guard should have been there January the 6th. And she said, no, I don't feel like, like that, that should, that, 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 that'd be an overkill in her eyes. In other words, they thought that all the prior agents, agencies and agents that they had there that day was going to be able to take care of, I don't know if they estimate it's 10,000, 5,000, 2,000. I don't know how many people that they estimated that happened January the 6th, but I'm pretty sure it was a high marking number that overwhelmed those those uh, Capitol Police and those uh, uh, security officers that day that basically busted right on in and made uh, made heyday 
and what that they was doing to where if they were to have been the military force there, I feel like that it could have been diverted. But was it diverted? Has anybody questioned the Speaker of the House? How come that she did not use proper protocol in something like that in bringing in uh, the military? Has there been any accountability pertaining to the Speaker of the House? And how come you haven't already done lost your job over this? These people that we are paying to protect us and take care of us, on a fe especially on a federal level, as far as I am concerned, for the past 30 plus years, they have, they have led us down a path of doom and gloom. And now they're trying to, to crawfish. Now they're trying to backpedal in that in which what has occurred just within the past year plus and a half, in addition towards what has occurred over in Russia with Ukraine. But there has just been so many failures from a government and the the uh, 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 security branches of this government that I don't even know if we could ever come clean in what the heck's going on. And whenever you have this type of uncertainty, you have all these trust issues. Whenever you have all these trust issues, then you have a madhouse. And that's basically what the government has created. It has created a madhouse. And I tend to wonder if those that was watching all of this from the sidelines, the powerful, the elite, the Congress, that this is not what was planned all along towards bringing in a circus clown and let's create all this, this turmoil that's basically nothing more than a diversion. That way it takes people's minds and it takes people's thoughts away from what they should actually be thinking about and looking at and we'll just use Donald Trump as a uh, as a big diversion towards instead of looking at others we they'll be looking at Donald Trump what's more there's more people to be looking at just with the Donald Trump issue other than Donald Trump to this day I still don't feel like there's been full accountability of those that allowed for 9-11 to occur, beginning with the prior president, Mr. Bush Jr. The American people have become awakened. They're not stupid. And they know that they have not gotten the bang for the buck in regards towards all this. And that's one reason why our government continues to, to crawfish the way that it's crawfishing towards, I think it was today, that our United States President basically squashed, squandered uh, the, the, uh, um, the notes of various people. I think they said it was over 20 million people that had tried to go to college to get a degree so that they could get a decent job and those jobs was not available. In other words, that system, that college system failed because the government failed. And of course, whenever you get to looking at how all of the jobs basically got jerked out from underneath us, you know, let's go back to Sam Walton that said, we will always sell nothing but American made brand, but as soon as the old man kicked the bucket, what did the, what did the people do that was in charge of that that business do? They cut our throats and they went to other places and they started purchasing stuff for a little bit of nothing, knowing good and well that the American people, based upon the salaries that they was already making, could not compete in making the same product and putting it out on the shelves. So you can't tell me that the American people doesn't feel like that they have not gotten the bang for the buck in the past 30 plus years and now our children and our children's children and their children is going to have to inherit 
as far as I'm concerned, a damn mess that goes beyond anything that I ever thought that would ever occur. I think we was a couple, maybe a couple uh, trillion dollars in debt whenever I come into the world back in the 60s. And there's been times that we, you know, showed uh, uh, to have basically a plus versus a minus. And, you know, people was handling things. You know, the government, the local government was handling things. The state government was handling things. The federal government was handling things. But it hasn't been until up until the past 30 years. Keep in mind, we went to war with Afghanistan and spent over $2 trillion. I don't know how much material that we left over there pertaining to tanks and everything else. And 11 days later, the very people that we was at war with took the country back over. There has to be some answers. There's too many loose ends in what the hell is going on with our American government. And that creates doubt, and doubt creates fear. Fear creates panic, and panic usually brings out the worst in some of the people that's willing to pick up arms and do things illegitimately until we can get all this sorted out. In which I don't know that it'd ever be sorted out. Once more, whenever you get to telling one lie and then another lie to cover up that lie and then another lie to, tell, to cover up the other lie and you just continue to keep covering up, covering up, covering up, I feel like that Homeland Security needs, needs, to, uh, needs to give an account for the things that they obviously have done or didn't do that they should have done. Homeland Security, like I said a while ago, tried to ruin my life. I got proof of it. Um, they, they made me out to be some sort of a maniac. Um, I've had basically uh, about two and a half years taken out of my life in being studied or going to this event or being uh, captured and going to this event and having this lie told on me and, and me having to fight my way out of this and fight my way out of that all the way to the local government right here in Weekly County, Tennessee. I me mean, coming back still having the motivation towards wanting to help people. Proof is in the pudding. You don't put up a sign on your building, a recovery shelter, based around the three H's with your grandmother's face on it, in the, in the uh, aspect of wanting to hurt the community versus wanting to help the community. There's too many unanswered questions. Too many loose ends. And because of it, the American people are going to start making demands out of all this. I don't know. I, I, I don't promote violence. I don't promote violence, even though the book of Revelations may promote violence pertaining to end time events that basically is the judgment of God falling down upon to society. I still promote God. I still promote Jesus Christ. I still promote the book of life. Because the book of life goes beyond just a natural life, but it goes into the supernatural life pertaining to the life beyond this life. I'm going to continue to promote the things that I've been promoting, even though people don't want to stand with me, even though they don't want to support me. You know, just the other day, I had words with an investigator that has a background of master teaching up in New York that had become a legal investigator I think over about 15 different states and I questioned him because something he showed me that I wasn't invited into I questioned his sincerity about that and then I brought up something else and then he said something else and then the next thing you know I, I brought up well you've never truly been for me pertaining to the things that I've been doing out into the eyes of the world either on my Facebook uh, platform or my YouTube platform and you know what his response was we do not do neither we don't support you and we're not against you well you know what the answer the true answer to that is if you do not support me in knowing that I support peace and love, grace, and the things out of the Bible, even though there's things in the Bible that 
basically scare me too as well. If you don't support me, to me, that means you're against me. Because even Jesus said, he that is with me cannot be against me. That's what's happened to the American people. The American people want to take the center path. They want to split the difference. They want to be right in the middle of the lukewarmness. Not too hot, not too cold. We don't want, we're not for you, Juby. We're not against you, Juby. We're just kind of there in the middle, kind of just floating around. Well, I got news for you. If you're not supporting something, that means you're against something. If you're not supporting something, you're against something. You can't just imaginarily think that you can stand in the middle and be neutral. Because those are the things that God says that he hates. He despises those who are lukewarm. And he said he'll spew thee out of thy mouth. Now you can continue to judge me. You can continue to condemn me. You can, t you can continue to bash me all you want. But the bottom line is this. A man by the name of Dennis James Jackson that lives at 291 Thompson Road, Charing, Tennessee, zip code 38255, that was raised up in northwest Tennessee, basically right here where my grandmother and her husband lived out their remaining lives, that this individual made clear of what he stood for, not deviating the, the differences towards playing the field either in the neutral level or playing the field towards being on the Lucifer, Luciferian side. I have never, never participated in any type of, of satanic worship and never will. I'd rather somebody just go ahead and load up a gun or come out here with an axe and cut my body into little bitty pieces. Because I'm not going to back up in that in which what I know that I know that I know is right towards standing up for the Lord thy God. First God, then country, then family. And if people don't like it, they can lump it. And it's pretty easy to tell that this individual that now I haven't spoken to in four or five days, which has been highly unusual, because for some reason he was attracted to me, and man, he wanted to stay in contact with me, and sometimes we would have four or five conversations a day. And I played along with this. I knew that I was targeted by this individual. And I knew that they was putting on a big act like they really cared about me for some reason. Well, if you really care about me, don't you think that you would care about the things that I that 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 interest me? I mean, I cared about the things that interested them to a certain degree. I'm not willing to to bow bow or bend over backwards pertaining to an unlawful uh, event, not for them or anybody else. But I was willing to play this little game. And then whenever I questioned them, and they said, well, we're not neither. Since then, I haven't gotten a telephone call from them, and, the, and I haven't returned a telephone call back to them. Just like the United Pentecostal preacher that was kind enough ever so often to text me back and say, thank you, Dennis, for sending me that, that link, or thank you, Dennis, for sending me that material. Or um, he hasn't never called me directly, but at least Brother Calum over there in the United Pentecostal Church would at least answer my telephone calls. I don't even know now if I was to try to call, if he would even answer any of my telephone calls. Probably wouldn't. Because he knows now that I was getting engaged with them for a reason other than me sitting on a pew and being a spectator, in which that's basically what they wanted me to do other than going up and praying with people and being prayed for and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as me becoming an active member in that church, I don't think I never would have been. Now, I was an active member in Central Baptist Church up, up the road here whenever I first come back in 20 and 14. Long about 20 and 15, whenever I decided to be a member, they accepted my membership, and I got to working with various people up here in Martin, Tennessee, including with Randy Brundridge, and they even let me into the choir towards singing because I got a decent voice. And 
I participated in some other activities as well as uh, sharing Christmas with them. Uh, having a Christmas party pertaining to the classmates that I was going going to church with. And they all was acting like that they liked me and they appreciated me and that they was willing to participate a friendship with me. Up until what happened towards them calling the police into my life illegitimately and deciding that they was going to ban me from Central Baptist Church over an incident that happened in another county that didn't have nothing to do with Central Baptist Church completely completely off the wall and, and since then nobody has called me nobody has um, has confronted me nobody has done any of the above why is that? Why does people act like that they're concerned about me until they find out about me? And then all of a sudden, bing, bam, they're gone. You know why? Because they do not have the same commitment to the same Heavenly Father, the same God as I do. And, and I guess it must scare people whenever they hear of somebody that's real because the American people has been fed for years and years and years pertaining to all this all this hibbijibi stuff and the American people's been fed with all this stuff about you know artificial intelligence and and aftermarket and and, and uh, um, aftermarket parts and and generic drugs and generic this and generic that all these fake entities that's the very thing that Donald Trump was talking about okay I realize Donald Trump has his own he has its own faults I sure don't agree with what he done up there in New York City towards uh, mishandling his affairs with all those contractors but when it comes to people being real I think it frightens people in America whenever they hear somebody like me that's willing to be as real as what I am towards saying the things that I say because they've been more adjusted to the lukewarm people well Juby we're not really for you but we're not against you well how can you do how can you make a stance like that and that very stance of being lukewarm is what has put us where we are, the trajectory of where we are right now, in seeing all this trouble and experiencing all these issues that as far as I'm concerned, right now we should be we should be in the middle of a great revival. And as far as I'm concerned, we should we should be looking at uh, prosperity and peace, not just for the Americans, but the whole world. But it's pretty obvious that they talked about peace out of one side of their mouths beginning in the in the late 80s and then they wanted to justify themselves with desert storm and desert shield that led into the afghanistan 20-year war that has now put us where we are today now how come people can't see that how come people can't understand that how come whenever i discuss things going back 30 plus years ago towards putting the dots together how come people can't see the same things that I see and understand the same things that I understand I'm gonna tell you why it's because they choose not to just like my investigator he finally let the cat out of the bag his feelings his emotions finally come out Juby we're not for you but we're not against you so now I know where you stand but you know what? I knew where you stood the whole time while you was playing me, while you was acting like that you cared about me. I actually went on a road trip with this guy while he was working, going to two different job sites in running an investigation towards going to people's houses and, and knocking on their doors and taking video and making sure that he documented what he was doing towards presenting whatever he was presenting to these people I actually went on a road trip with this person I actually took this person to Louisville Kentucky 
in my automobile after that he had bought an automobile and he agreed that he was going to pay me a certain amount of money for my gas and, and the expenses and that's one of the reasons why that I went on up from Louisville over to Lexington, Kentucky and I got the paperwork coming from the Lexington headquarters pertaining to how that they had uh, redacted my, my files that way I wasn't getting secondary information I actually went to that organization I had to pay twenty dollars just for them to type out this little piece of paper that verified what was already in their court system to begin with but yeah I went out of my way to take this individual all the way to Louisville Kentucky and I've helped him also in some other um, home projects of some things that he was involved in himself pertaining to his own son and a house that I rather not disclose where it's at but I, the point that I'm trying to make is this that as soon as I cornered him up in him having to give me an answer and he did give me an answer but the answer that he gave me Juby we're not neither we are not neither we're not for the windmill ministries and then again we're not against the windmill ministries well I got news for you if you're not for me in actuality you actually are against me you may not think that you're against me, but in actuality, you are against me. And the reason why that you're against me is because it would be the same thing as, as the Good Samaritan that met the person on the road that was beat up, that at that point in time, that Good Samaritan had two choices to make. He could have either become a Good Samaritan or a Bad Samaritan. He could have either seen what he was looking at and walked away and acted like that he didn't see it and ignore it which would have made him a bad Samaritan or he could have chose to help the individual that had just recently been robbed and beat up and that's exactly what he done and those things is recorded in the book of life so when people think that they that they uh, are presented with a situation or presented with a person or presented with a problem by them walking away from that problem and them thinking that they're not going to be held accountable because they didn't partake in that they're thinking that that I'm pleading the, the fifth here or, or I'm going to be neutral I'm not going to get engaged in this in this particular person's problem by them walking away they actually are against because if the Good Samaritan would have walked away from the person that had been beaten almost to the point of death and that person would have died that person's blood would have been upon that person that chose not to do nothing for that person that he would have stood being charged in the great judgment day in God questioning this individual and asking him why did you make the decision that you made towards walking away from a situation that you know that you should have partaked in. So in actuality, if that individual did walk away, in which thank God that he didn't, but if, if he did, he was making a conscious choice towards being against saving that person's life versus making a conscious decision towards saving that person's life. Do you follow what I'm saying? So whenever people stumble upon the truth and they know of a particular situation going on, by them walking it out, by thinking that, you know what, I'm just going to step this one out. I'm not going to participate one way or the other. I'm going to plead neutral. That way I'm not involved. Well, you know what, you're already involved. You're already involved, number one, because now that has been presented to you and number two you have now made a conscious decision towards rather than helping that person in that situation you've walked away and by you walking away you've actually made a conscious choice towards wanting to hurt that person versus help that person now I realize that the extremes that I just got through using is in fact extremes pertaining to a person that's wounded mortally beat up and at the point of death but it can be just on the other other uh, scenario just as real as the person that was beat up because 
you take an individual such as myself that's been trying to gain a support team, that has been trying to enlighten the people about the truth, and they continue to sit on their hands with their hands up underneath their hips, and, and then them going to plead not guilty? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Don't think for a second that you're going to be able to plead not guilty and get away with it because you was given the opportunity that you could have supported that ministry, but you consciously chose not to. That is such of the most undermining thinking that Satan has brought into the American people's lives that once more God himself hates. It talks about hating two things, and of course we all know that God hates sin because he never would have given us the instructions of fulfilling the commandments of God versus wanting us to break the commandments of God, but two things that it explicitly talks about that he hates. One is people that's lukewarm. They choose not to make that choice, and they choose not to get engaged. He hates those people that are lukewarm. He said that he'll spew them out of his mouth, and he hates those that profess to be Jews and are not. In other words, they're going off of the off of the uh, off of the appearances of being part of the bloodline, and they're truly not. And you won't never hear me say that I'm a Jew, even though my name may be Jew B. But you'll never hear me profess that I am some sort of a Jew because I know that I'm not. I'm an engrafted Gentile through the blood of Christ. And that is the only thing that makes me worthy to be able to go boldly before the throne and talk to my Heavenly Father. Even though I may make some of the craziest mistakes and I may make failures pertaining to the flesh, I know because of the teachings of Christ that He is constantly making intercession prayer for all of His children. For if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. One day that advocate with the Father is going to be taken away. I don't know if preachers realize that or not, but whenever the Lord comes back and resurrects his people from this earth and gets uh, those that's already saved from this, this despair that Satan and Satan's uh, followers have manifested here upon to the planet, at that point in time, it talks about that Christ will be on the right hand of the Father making intercession prayer towards stopping God from bringing great wrath down upon to the people. At that point in time, Christ will no longer be making intercession prayer for those upon to the planet. You know why I know this? Because the Bible says that he will be the one that will be handing out the rewards. He will be the one that will be giving out uh, basically uh, complimentary uh, to the saints pertaining to the things that the saints have had to embark in that it was only because of the intercession coming from Christ that made us worthy to stand before the Heavenly Father. He knows our hearts. He knows our weaknesses. He knows who we are. But my point being at this, whenever people are going through that seven-year tribulation, yes, it does say that it was as the sands of sea of those that did not take the mark, that was beheaded or starved to death, and they was crying out, How long, O Lord, shall it be till you avenge us pertaining to our blood? And it was said that they should rest yet for a short season in the Gog and Magog. It's a in the Gog and Magog. That's what it says in the Bible. In the Gog and Magog. And, and that's whenever uh, somewhere in between uh, the uh, latter part of the sixth chapter of Revelations versus somewhere into about the 18th or 19th chapter of Revelations is whenever they'll be resurrected themselves pertaining to the second resurrection and then after the thousand year millennium that will be whenever the third and final resurrection will occur and that's whenever God will bring destruction unto the souls of those that follow after the wickedness of Satan the final and last time that follow after Lucifer in the Gog and Magog that's according to the Bible's teachings now that ain't my teachings. That's the way that I've interpreted the Bible pertaining to the things that's going to occur in the final last setting. 
right before God wipes away all our tears and recreates a new heaven and a new earth. Let's listen to some more of this, please. Right to see who's out in the field and you know what the NSA is capable of doing with your cell, with cell phones abroad and stuff. It's preposterous, and I suspect that's what's in the blacked out uh, areas of this affidavit that we don't have yet. The second thing is, you know, when you're reading an affidavit, you're also looking for kind of characteristics of kind of the personalities. What do they think? And this document, even just the parts we have, just reveals that the FBI, the Justice Department, think that Donald Trump is a is a liar. So if you look at paragraph 25, for example, they talk about how the archivist on February 18th of this year said to Trump, "Hey, we found some classified documents here." and you know and identified concerns and the like that's a formal letter that was sent by the archivist later that day trump's account tweets out saying they quote did not find anything they were given upon request presidential records in an ordinary and routine process as part of the preservation of my legacy uh, you know those two things are fundamentally inconsistent with one another and i think what what the the affidavit is trying to do is to say don't trust this guy. You can't believe him. Uh, what's so extraordinary there is, as you point out, that's laid out in lawyerly terms in paragraph 25, and then they have a facsimile of the press release from the Save America Political Action Committee. So they show, you know, the evidence that he was saying that he had turned everything over and, and that they had found nothing. Uh, Kelly O'Donnell, you covered this man full time for many years. Um, the MO. Which I'm going to say this for the record. It goes back to what that they was doing to the Lord Jesus Christ by punishing him, scourging him right before they crucified him. For what good work does thou crucify me for? And they lied again and said, oh, for, for a good work we lie, we persecute you not. But for you claiming that you are the Son of Man, that's what we're crucifying you for because we believe that you're, you are, have committed blasphemy. In other words, we think that you're fraudulent, we think that you're a liar, and because we think that you're a liar, that's why we're going to rough you up and kill you. That was what they were saying. Well, you know, there's no way to deny the fact that my life has been spared again and again and again for me to rattle off a bunch of lies and a bunch of stuff that is untruthful pretending to my testimony. And it doesn't matter if the people, by and large, don't want to support this ministry or not. That's not going to deny or ignore the truth towards what, in fact, happened to me towards the supernatural stuff that I continue to tell people about it's not going to change it one way or the other just because they don't believe it or they don't support it. They don't understand that. Just because they don't go along with it or they don't support it doesn't mean that it's not so. Now the deal with Donald Trump, it's pretty obvious that the FBI don't trust him. And that's the reason why they're doing what they're doing. Get compliance from the former president in what the government believed was his improper handling of this material. So it wasn't a case of, oh, put a lock on the door and we're all good. That was a very different public framing by the former president and his associates about how that played out when they say he has been cooperative. When Tom talked about how there were disparate pieces mixed into boxes, we know from uh, the president's public, uh, many of the people in his life, in his public life, both as a businessman and uh, in his time at the White House, at the end of the day, he would scoop up the things on his desk and put them into a box and take them to the residence. And there you would possibly explain how a personal note, a confidential document, and well, other things that well, are unrelated could end up in the same location, including things like his passports. So what this gives us is a window into Donald Trump's uh, personal practices that are very much in conflict with what he and his associates have been arguing publicly over these last three weeks. Andrea? And Joyce Vance, as a pro uh, former prosecutor, where does it go now? Well, that's exactly the point of this entire exercise. This is all about making sure that DOJ can move forward. One very interesting tidbit that we get from the legal uh, memo that DOJ submitted to unseal the redacted version of the affidavit 
is what I think, Andrea, is the first effort to quantify the number of cooperating witnesses that DOJ had when they obtained this search warrant. And they're talking about the need to protect their witnesses oh. from any sort of potential harm. And they say that there are a significant number of civilian witnesses. So we don't know, is that five, is that 10? But I think it's important to realize here that DOJ was not just relying on one or two witnesses. Likely this is, as they say, a significant number of civilian witnesses, as well as people in law enforcement who need to be protected as this investigation moves forward. And that puts into context what we're looking at here. We're talking about a former president of the United States who's clearly taken with him when he left office materials, whether they're classified or not, that could do grave damage to our national security if they're disclosed in an inappropriate fashion. And not only is that former president resistant to returning those documents, also DOJ has legitimate reasons to believe that there are risk to witnesses who are helping it complete this investigation. That should be a sobering moment for all of us to realize that we're in this situation with former President Trump. Well, I think uh, we have had a, an extraordinary... That is, that is a very, very dangerous situation. And, and it's a situation that, as far as I am concerned, as an American, red-blooded American at the age of 61, as far as I am concerned, this goes beyond gross negligence or carelessness to the point that they have failed the American people again and again and again. And when will true accountability come in favor towards the people that put them in power to begin with? What's more, I don't go along with violence. I don't support violence. But, you know, whenever it's a clause in the American Constitution, I think it's the 24th Amendment or something like that, that if the government can no longer provide the needs of the American people, that the American people has a right to stand up against that particular government that is functioning in the way towards not producing the the, uh, the needs to the American people. Now, so far, uh, Biden has take, taken back seat and he has done this, 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 and this, and just like uh, taken away the 20 million uh, plus people that, that was engaged in these loans, pretending to go into college, thinking that they was gonna get some sort of a, a big boost in, in their work ethics towards their careers. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, what he's doing so far is appropriate towards a government that's at least trying to pedal backwards in, in uh, doing the right thing for its people. But I don't know how much longer that they're going to be able to think that they're going to be able to do this, especially whenever you're trying to uh, borrow your money out of debt and you're still getting further and further and further in debt. There's going to have to be some sort of a reckoning happening with our national debt somewhere down the road. If not, we're just going to pass it from one generation to another. And these are the very things that our children and our children's children are going to inherit. So when is it going to stop? When is there going to be accountability? When are we going to be able to start afresh? I don't know. Frank Bigluzzi, former assistant director for uh, counterintelligence at the FBI and an NBC News national security analyst. Uh, Charles Coleman, a former prosecutor and an NBC News legal analyst um, as well. Welcome to you all, guys. Um, so we've been spending the last 30 minutes or so, it seems, kind of sifting through um, all of these documents, trying to disseminate kind of the justification, right, for this search warrant and the communication that was had between the National Archives, the Department of Justice, along with uh, the Trump team. And there's a heck of a lot of really interesting stuff and kind of mind-blowing stuff in all of it. Ryan, let me just start with you on this one and kind of um, ask you what stands out to you so far in this affidavit. 
you know, there's a lot notable about this. One thing I really wanted to highlight here, just because I think it's remarkable considering the source. Uh, so Donald Trump's lawyer back in May wrote this letter uh, to uh, to the Justice Department, essentially accusing them of getting politics involved in this investigation. You know, I would remind you of the fact that this all stays secret. DOJ didn't speak about this for months, uh, even though there was this ongoing dialogue. And, you know, the president, had, uh, the former president had stored all these records down at Mar-a-Lago that he wasn't supposed to have. But I want to read you this quote because it's from Evan uh, Corcoran um, saying yeah. that we request that uh, the uh, we request that DOJ adhere to longstanding policies and procedures regarding communications between DOJ and the White House regarding pending investigative matters, which are designed to prevent political interference in DOJ in DOJ decision making. Just to highlight that and underscore it, that's Donald Trump's lawyer saying that there should be a wall between the Justice Department and and the White House. You know, he had some issues with that. Uh, during his own administration, it's sort of remarkable that he would make that point explicitly and say, oh, make sure there's no interference between uh, be, uh, with uh, the, the DOJ decision making process by the White House. And of course, we haven't seen any indications of that coming from the Biden administration, which has been very hands off of this uh, investigation. So somewhat ironic, um, to say the least. Kendall Lanian, um, let's talk um, the contents of some of this um, affidavit, which I find fascinating, the classification of some of the documents that were contained, that they believe were contained um, being stored at Mar-a-Lago, the high classification of them, really, and who they could feasibly compromise. Yeah, Yasmin, that's what really jumped out to me as somebody who's covered the intelligence community for a lot of years. Um, these kinds of markings are not seen on documents that are found outside of special facilities designed to house classified documents, period, end of story. I mean, human control system it was one of the markings they found on, on documents. That, that connotes a, a, a basically a CIA field report, a report by a CIA officer, perhaps maybe a, a defense intelligence agency officer, but normally CIA, about his or her debriefing of a confidential source overseas, a spy. Now, normally those reports don't leave the CIA, but in some cases, I'm told, uh, when, when senior intelligence officials are briefing the president on a significant intelligence development, they may want to show the president exactly where it came from and, and, the, and the direct source information. This is raw intelligence. This is not finished intelligence written up by analysts. This is right from the, 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 the collector. And so if that's what happened here and he took it uh, home with him and it ended up in Mar-a-Lago, that is just absolutely hey, hey, stunning. Ken, let me let me let me step in for one moment because I do want folks to understand what you're talking about, right? This human control system or HCS as it's classified, um, it's designed to protect intelligence information derived from clandestine human sources, commonly referred to, um, and this is by the way I'm reading from the affidavit here as human intelligence. The HCS control system protects human intelligence derived information, information relating to human intelligence activities, capabilities, techniques, processes and procedures. I mean, you don't have to watch Homeland to know how incredibly important something like this is and how important it is to protect these sources overseas, right. um, their safety, especially considering the position they're putting themselves in. Right, so in English, what you just read there means it's generally a report from a CIA officer about his or her conversations and debriefings of a spy. Super sensitive stuff. It may not have the name of the source, but it may have identifying information. Not the kind of stuff that ever gets outside a, a vault, essentially. And the other really alarming uh, designation is SI, for signals intelligence, which means NSA, it could mean, and National Security Agency intercepts of foreign leader communications or other kinds of phone calls, emails. The NSA is vacuuming stuff up all over the world. It's super highly classified. It's, it's, it makes up, in many cases, uh, three quarters of the president's daily intelligence brief because they're getting a lot of really good stuff. Uh, but that is very, very secret stuff. And if it, the idea that documents with those markings were in Mar-a-Lago, again, just alarming. And and there's you know other markings. No foreign means intelligence so sensitive it can't be shared with any foreign nationals, including our closest allies, the Brits and the Australians. And ORCON meaning originator control which is uh, just means that the agency that has the document decides who sees it. So just another you know, evidence of how highly classified these documents are. And the last thing I want to say, Yasmin, is, is in, the, in the memorandum of law, separate from the affidavit that they filed, we also learned something important, which is that the Justice Department said that there are a significant number of civilian witnesses 
whose identities they need to protect. So yeah. the idea that there was one informant, one confidential human source that, that gave them a roadmap to this whole thing is belied by this language. There are a lot of people talking to the FBI. By yes. the way, Ken, that's not the last thing um, you're going to say. You're sticking around as you guys are sifting <laughs> okay. through um, these documents because we have a lot um, to get through to with that. Um, but, but Shaq, I want to come to you um, down at Mar-a-Lago because I know um, the former president now is... Uh, responding to the release of this now uh, redacted copy um, of this affidavit. That's exactly right. We've seen three individual posts from the former president. Two of them were audio posts, one an actual... Let's see real quick if there's some sort of an official... I mean, this is just media talking right here in, in their, in their uh, frame of conversation. But let's see if there's an actual official comes on and discusses any of this to the media. Speaking right there, she's a spokesman for the, for the White House. ...has been raised by uh, lawmakers. We've seen the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is evenly divided, Republicans and Democrats. Most committees are, are, are not split as evenly, but intelligence always is. They have said uh, that they want uh, to have a review of a damage assessment, if you will, of materials that were uh, at Mar-a-Lago, either those surrendered earlier in the process or those seized uh, during the execution of the search warrant, and what was uh, the possible risk to national security. Those questions have been asked by lawmakers. The Department of Justice has indicated that this is an active investigation and typically uh, that needs to operate in its own sphere and not have oversight while the investigation is going on. Clearly, uh, the uh, members of Congress have some oversight over what happens at the Department of Justice. So there's a lot of distancing that's happening yeah. in the Biden administration from the Department of Justice. There was a question you asked uh, just a short time before the break about, uh, does anybody look in the boxes? Yeah. And so the General Services Administration is responsible for the transport of goods from uh, a president uh, who is leaving office to their home. What is interesting is they are simply putting together the truck and the order to ship it. It is the outgoing transition team that is required to do uh, the packing of the boxes, the, the organizing of pallets, and to sign for those contents. And so the outgoing transition team, so people who are working for, in this case, Trump, would have signed uh, that those goods that were being packed were necessary for the office of the former president or his personal belongings. And so that's how they determined that. Uh, the presumption... So those are the people that should be fired because it should have uh, it should have been stopped right there towards him not being able to do that because they themselves know the stuff that they was packing up was considered top secret or secret or classified, etc. And if they wasn't so sure in in doing what that they was doing, then uh, then maybe they should have made a telephone call to somebody and found out if this was right or wrong or this was legal or, or illegal. There has to be more people that gives an account for this other than Donald Trump. That's the reason why we have we pay good money security measures of preventing from something like this ever happening. And it has happened on Donald Trump's watch. Is that you're not taking government records you're not entitled to. Yeah. Uh, and so there isn't a looking in each of the boxes based on the reporting I've been doing on this, uh, but that is how it's done. And as you know, it's done on January 20th in a very hasty way with packing done uh, in the days leading up to it. And for this particular former president, it was a particularly hasty circumstance because he didn't want to leave office and didn't think he would have to. Not like the end of a two-term presidency mm -hmm. when there's a lot of buildup and packing that goes on for a much longer period of time. A lot of good information there, Kelly. And maybe she's right. Maybe, maybe because of what happened January the 6th, it was a distraction in and of itself uh, pertaining to people not following proper protocol and in them paying attention to the very materials that was being hauled out. Maybe she's right, but technically speaking, there still should be accountability issues towards the people that helped him pack those boxes. 
and put them on freight to take them where they took them. Boy, you talk about confusion. I realize it was a confusion time, but we're still talking about the well-being of the security of the American people that has been compromised. And because it's been compromised, I feel like that there should be accountability here. There, Kelly O. Um, we thank you um, for filling, in us, filling us in on that. Actually, I want to pick up on one thing that Kelly just brought up. Chuck, if you could fill us in a little bit on the damage assessment. I know that hasn't yet been launched. Some of the conversations that we've been having on air with folks that know a bit about when a damage assessment is actually launched, there could be some sort of informal damage assessment happening as they're going through um, sifting through some of the documents that they seized from Mar-a-Lago. But what is the justification for holding off on that? Well, first, just take the notion of a damage assessment, Yasmin, outside of this political vortex. When we have highly classified information and we worry that it's been compromised in some way, intentionally, unintentionally, you know, willfully, negligently, whatever it may be, it's incumbent on the intelligence community to try and figure out if any damage has been done. If damage has been done, what do we need to do to protect our sources and our methods and our assets? So this is, I don't want to say it's a routine thing because fortunately we don't have routine compromises of highly classified information. But when we do, or when we fear it, then we do a damage assessment. And so, look, I assume that this is just something that is reflexively done uh, within the intelligence community. I've seen the results of these types of assessments when I was a federal prosecutor and when I was at the FBI, something that we take very seriously because we spend a lot of human capital and you know money uh, in order to stand up these intelligence systems, signals intelligence, human intelligence, all sorts of ways in which we collect information to help protect the national security of the United States. So I assume it's being done. It is done when we believe there's been a compromise and we have to think of it not as Republicans or Democrats or left or right, but outside of the political vortex as something we need to do to protect the national security interests of the United States. All right, so here's what we're going to do, guys, um, with the three brilliant legal minds that I have um, on this panel. Um, I first want to kind of talk about what is standing out to you um, amongst these 38 pages, a bit tongue-tied there. And then we're going to address what happens next. Right? A lot of folks watching this and saying, okay, what is going to come of all of this? Um, so, so, Chuck, let me just start with you and, and ask you that very question. What stood out to you? Well, you know, I was actually more interested in the memorandum that the government filed uh, with the uh, redacted affidavit than in the affidavit itself, mm. because I wasn't terribly surprised that we didn't get the good stuff. And the stuff we did get, the procedural history, in many ways, was largely known. So I would commend to your viewers, Yasmin, that they take a look at the memo that was filed with the affidavit, because it explains the rationale for why you keep this stuff under seal. You don't want witnesses to be threatened or retaliated against. We want to protect the safety of law enforcement officers. And we saw what happened in um, the FBI field office in Ohio. Uh, you want to abide the law. And Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of um, Criminal Procedure require that grand jury information uh, and information derived from grand jury investigations be kept secret. You don't want to give a roadmap um, to people who might obstruct the investigation. And uh, last but not least, you want to protect the privacy interests of individuals who may be mentioned in an affidavit but haven't done anything wrong. And so it's a very cogent, very thoughtful explanation by the government of why the most important part of this affidavit, the probable cause basis, remains redacted. Read it. It makes sense. So let me read a part of it, Chuck, um, for folks, especially the part that you were just referring to, because I do think it's incredibly important. I'm talking about possible witness um, intimidation. Um, some information falls within more than one category. The categories described are information from a broad range of civilian witnesses who may be subject to witness intimidation or uh, retaliation, information regarding investigative avenues and techniques that could provide a roadmap for potential ways to obstruct the investigation information whose disclosure is prohibited under Rule 6C, um, Rule 6C which Chuck just uh, mentioned, such as grand jury subpoenas, testimony, and related material, 
and then information whose disclosure could risk the safety of law enforcement personnel, which we have already seen after the search um, took place, and information whose disclosure could harm legitimate privacy interests of uh, third parties. Um, Shan Wu, let me bring you into the conversation here and ask- What I'm getting out of this, that the stuff that's been redacted is the stuff that basically is not permitted to the American people. They've done the exact same thing by reducing my charge up in Kentucky. Rather than get into a long spill of why that I was charged, it just said that I was redacted time served of a misdemeanor. Bingo. That's all they're going to say. Pertaining to that particular incident that happened in my personal life that resonated in 20 and 12 whenever they come all the way out to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma and pick me up. Now, pertaining to redacting, okay, I'm understanding that there's different types of redacting. You can redact it by hiding it or you can redact it by reducing it, okay? Whenever the incident happened to me out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, whenever I was out there and they planted a bomb in the back of my truck, the next day, I went to City Hall, pertaining to the damages that they'd done to my personal private property, and I requested for them to pay me back, and they said, well, in order to do this, you're going to have to go get at least three different estimates on what the cost is. So I went back the next day with three different estimates of what it would cost to replace the, uh, the camper shell, and they had to go through this special process of looking at it and of course eventually they denied having any liability even though it was done on on public TV being recorded and even though they had no justification in doing what they done other than it being a sleeping bag in the back of my truck. I did take notice whenever I went and got the official paperwork that about half of the stuff that was said or done was blacked out just like the information that you're looking out with Donald Trump. Once more, the agency protects itself. And the agency don't want to let the cat out of the bag because if it does, that could be information that could be against that agency. Well, to this day, their local news and Channel 9, 13, 11, and all their other local uh, state programs over there has still got the same stuff on their network indicating that I had threatened one of their police officers knowing darn good and well that I never did make a threat to Mr. Burns, Lieutenant Burns. But now if somebody reads that, they're not going to know the difference because they don't explain themselves to the general public that I had went to court six different times with a J silver nail that helped to get that charge thrown out. In addition to them not releasing the video of the things that was being said that day towards an investigation that was tainted and the lies that the federal authorities had bled to the American people pertaining to a government cover-up out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. That stuff was recorded as I was speaking. But rather than expose that to the general public, it would make me look good and them look bad. So they're still redacting that information. In other words, they're not exposing it to the general public and they're still keeping that that information on those local news stations out there indicating that I'm the monster and I'm the bad guy and that they're the good guy. And the whole time they was the bad guy because what went on that afternoon while I was at the Muriel building of the uh, previous uh, bomb site did not justify any of those actions that was done that afternoon much less planting a bomb in the back of my truck and making, trying to make an example out of me. That still has yet to be clarified 
to the American people, not just the not just the people in Oklahoma, but the but the American people in the world in general. In other words, that's a stain that they have purposely put on my life that is still there. Just like the stain that they tried to put on my life right up here in Martin, Tennessee, of falsifying files that the that the the uh, uh, dumbfounded attorney, the crooked attorney Benjamin Dempsey went ahead and went along with the system and said, well, if you just plead guilty, time served, you'll get to go home. Well, me as a dummy that didn't know how to represent myself felt like that the information that Mr. Benjamin Dempsey was giving me was the proper information. The thing about it was I wasn't in no theater. I didn't create no panic. I wasn't planning on creating no panic. I didn't pull down a fire alarm pertaining to falsified files. But did I know that at that time? No, because I had bad representation. Same way up there in Kentucky, whenever they nailed me for two non-threatening telephone calls that I had not violated any judge's order. These people that are working under the shadows of, legit of legitimacy, now it's catching up with them. It's catching up with them, and now the people are seeing just exactly what type of people that it is that's working out of these county and state and federal facilities. Because not only have they failed us towards protecting us, but they are going after the wrong people in trying to cover up their own tracks pertaining to their mistakes. If the truth be known, the people that they should have went after was the people that helped load up the boxes and let and allowed Donald Trump to get out of the parking lot that day with all his stuff that put it on pallets. It never should have left the White House. That's my point. So when if you're talking about accountability issues, uh, it actually starts on the front end, not the rear end. They're beating the horse on the wrong end uh, in part of this, pertaining to what Donald Trump had done because there's more people that should be held accountable other than Donald Trump and his immediate left administration. I think they call it his uh, cabinet. Whatever cabinet members was left in his administration uh, was those very far and few. And basically it was the uh, Secret Service uh, parties that uh, that had been assigned to Donald Trump, the ones that he, he found favor in, that he allowed to uh, go with him. That's basically got a got a, uh, a guaranteed check for now until life towards protecting the, the life and the president of Donald J. Trump. What the weekly county authorities done in my life by not evaluating that the charge up in Kentucky had been redacted proves the illegitimacy of the Weekly County judicial justice system because in their prosecutors they had thought that I had been legally charged and that was the whole deal in and of a nutshell towards them coming at me towards me being a repeat offender which put me on the category of being a federal offender. How can they charge me for me being a repeat offender whenever the initial charge was redacted? They broke the law up here in Weekly County whenever they done what they done. In addition to me having the motivation, my brother and I, of being concerned about three little children across the road. Once more, me being punished for trying to help people and trying to do the right thing. Just like me giving out advisories pertaining to electrical disturbances up around the Kentucky Dam. I got punished not only the first time, not only the second time by spending six months of my life in, in, a, in a federal institution in, in downtown Chicago, the MCC uh, authorities there, uh, but they also took out almost another year out of my life towards taking me to the range Kentucky and filling me full of poison over the same ordeal towards me trying to help them versus trying to hurt them. What's happened to our country? What's happened to our government? What's happened to various government officials that claim that they're working for the benefit of the people, 
but the very people that's trying to help them, they're attacking. And the very people that are hurting them, that's on the same side that they're on, they let go. So this is a very complex, dangerous situation, and I'm going to end this where it is right now because it's taking up too much of my time pretending this video. And the best that I can say is pray for the situation. Pray that God moves pertaining to a mighty revival that should should have been uh, fully exposed in a declaration going all the way back to 1980 and 8 whenever nine tapes wound up going to the White House. Pray that God will intervene before basically the world annihilates itself by all the water reservoirs drying up and people not knowing which way to turn or what to do. Pray that God will intervene because I promise you the road that we're on right now is not going to be pretty once we get to the path of it. Thanks again. Good luck to all of us. As we say, God bless America. God bless our troops. God bless America's endeavors. And shalom. Thank you.